Welcome to Community Conversations, the podcast series from Crime Stoppers. I'm Richard Myron. In this series, we're taking a close look at the issue of knife crime, which has become a headline concern throughout the country. In this episode, I've come to Tyneside in the northeast. I'm with an invited audience in a neighbourhood in North Shields. So far in this series, we've heard about the increase in knife crime caused by county lines drug gangs. But the picture here is different. This community has amongst the highest levels of unemployment and social deprivation in England. But knife crime hasn't become the major problem it's developed into elsewhere, although there is a sense that it could do so. Local agencies and organisations play a critical role in reacting to what's going on here, as well as in being proactive in preventing young people from taking a wrong turn or getting involved in knife crime. I've been out and about here in North Tyneside to get an understanding of the area from those who live and work here. So I'm standing on the street here in North Tyneside. This area where I am suffers from generational social deprivation. I've come here to find out particularly about youth crime, what it does to this community and how organisations like the Phoenix to That Youth Project, where I'm just standing outside now, deal with it. Let's go on in. Hi, Becky. Welcome. Introduce yourself, if you would. I'm Becky Rowe. I'm the Senior Detached Youth Worker at Phoenix Detached Youth Project. We work with any young person aged 12 to 25 who lives in our catchment area, and we support young people on a whole range of issues. It could be to do with health, mental health, physical health, sexual health. I mean, our ultimate goal is to get all young people into educational training, but for a lot of young people we work with, there's a lot of barriers that they need to overcome before they're even in a position to do that. And our main focus is kind of, if young people are identifying issues, we'll work with them to create solutions to those issues. So historically, we've done pieces of work on domestic abuse, self-harm, alcohol, knife crime. These are all issues that young people have identified. So you have had incidents in recent years, particularly there was the murder of a young man due to knife crime. How do you use instances like this to inform your work? I think for us, our work's always about making it relevant to the young people who live here. So unfortunately, with the young man being killed, who we had worked with for years, it had a big impact on the whole community and a lot of the young people we work with. And I think it's about, we're now working with his family just to try and make young people aware that this unfortunately does happen in the area where they live. And it's about, you know, trying to stop that from happening again by, you know, making young people aware that carrying knives does have consequences for themselves and the wider community. Becky, what are you trying to do here through your work? So we see our role as informal educators and it is about making young people aware of opportunities that are available to them and the support they, they can get in life. And it is about being that sounding board for young people. If things have gone wrong, you know, what are their options? Presumably affecting their, their positive behaviour so they make the right choices. I mean, yeah. ultimately, yes, that's what we want young people to do, kind of be aware that if they do make this decision, that can lead to such and such consequences. And we give people not just second chances, but third, fourth, fifth chances. Becky, thank you. Thank you very much. So we've now left the Phoenix Detached Youth Project and come out into the areas in which it's served, come through an estate to a park here where there's a skate park that they've helped to get extended. And we're going to meet someone here who's uh, from the local area. Hi, Brian. Hi, Richard. Hi, nice to meet you. You're from this area. You're, you're yes. 20 years old. You, you grew up not far from here, right? Yeah. So what is it about this place here where we've come to that's important, do you think, for young people in the community? It gives them some place to go, something to strive to be better for. An example of myself, I was young when I started here. I lost, for example, a lot of weight, gained a lot of friends just through the experience of being at the skate park. But it also, I led a group which extended the skate park got more of the skate park built so for the new generations they now have something better than we had and hopefully can be better than we are now through the skate park sounds cheesy but it's a place that gives people hope to do better i know yeah. you're in work now but there is a problem with a lot of people in getting school qualifications and getting work isn't there in this area i went to one of the main schools in the area a big problem is attitude learning from 
the people. Um, obviously, the young, they want to have fun. And then later on in life, when it's time to be adults, it's hard for them, and it was hard for me. A lot of jobs are looking for very high qualifications, they want experience, but it's impossible to have both of that without the job in the first place. So I think my generation is quite stuck and very limited at what we can do. And obviously where people, young people, are not working, I'm sure there's like the temptation of petty crime or of drugs and other things like that. Is that yeah. what you witnessed? I've witnessed it a lot. People are a bit down... They don't see the point in many things, so they try to, like, really get fun in other places where they shouldn't. How important has been, like, the youth services here? I think it's really important, and the Phoenix has did a good job with the local area of that, because, for example, myself, I was 12 when I joined them. They kept us from loitering on the streets, gave us a good childhood and good experiences, and then because of the relationship I developed with them, that over the years taught us the right way to do things and social experiences but they also then give us opportunity to have employment and for example I found it hard in interviews because I don't have a lot of money so I had no good suit good attire but the Phoenix through the funding they provided me that and it's little things that they do contribute to everyone that they can which makes the monumental differences realistically you're not in that situation to do the crime To hear more about this situation, I'm joined by three people who are uniquely qualified to talk about it. Sylvia Welsh grew up not far from here. In 2016, she lost her son, Rhys, to knife crime. He was murdered. Mike Burgess is a project manager with the Phoenix Detached Youth Project, which we also heard from earlier there in the piece. And also Mike Lockhart, who works for Streetwise, an organisation that's based in Newcastle, and specifically, Michael works with black, Asian and minority ethnic men. Sylvia, if I can turn to you, first of all, I mentioned there the terrible experience you had. Can you tell us about Rhys and what happened to Rhys? Basically, he was lured to his death. His killer came to my house and smashed my window. He phoned him to say, go home, go and see your mum, see what I've done. And um, Rhys came running home. He had been out with his friends and I was at the door. He already knew where he was going. He just like looked at us and went, which way did he go and chase after? I watched him and I shouted at him to come back home. I just said, I was like, going to get the police, just come back. But he went running along and then three people went chasing after Reese and I thought it was like to jump on him. So I ran after them and I got to the scene and Rhys had already been stabbed and he collapsed and Reese passed away. Well, uh, yeah, he collapsed in my arms. I just tried to stem the blood, but unbeknown to me, I'd, I think it was about 17 force injuries with two sharp, with two knives. OK. Yeah. So the last three years since Reese passed away, I, I don't think anybody could ever imagine the hell that you've been through. Mm. It it's literally hasn't really hit. I can only explain that. You're not you anymore. It's like an out-of-body experience. You just... I knew it happened, but I didn't. I can picture it to this day, but it's like I'm not there anymore. I'm just the shell of a person. But it's not till now that I've come out of myself and took a step back and realised what's happened and how much it's affected a lot of people around you, the family. It's now that it's really starting to show on the family. Me other kids struggle. They just can't hold a place at college they just they're not themselves anymore it's you know you're like you're living but you're not you're trapped in this non-existence it's and it's never going to stop it's continuing on and then for generations to come it's just it's always going to be there we've got to tell our future kids our future grandkids and it's the elephant in the room kind of thing isn't it it's just always there but you have tried to take this appalling experience and try to take a message forward from it to yeah. others, haven't you? Like I say, I was the first three years I've not really been there. I've just, and then I just woke up one day and I, everywhere I went, I realised everybody was talking about knife crime and it was, you turned on the telly, it's on the news, you, you're watching it, the soap, it's, you know, and people love it. They love the glory of seeing it. They're not getting the proper emotion of it. They're not seeing the real life side of it, how it affects people, how it ricochets and affects the people that had to deal with it that night. And 
And I just thought, I don't want my kids growing up to this. I don't want my grandson growing up to this. It's got to be stopped. We've got to start trying to do something about it. Sylvia, thank you. Mike Burgess, the project manager at the Phoenix Detached Youth Project. You knew Reese as well, didn't you? He came to your programmes. Yeah, I'd worked with him since he was 12. Uh, he was only in the week before on the computer looking for work and gone the following week. And so it was, it was difficult for me as a person because I'd worked them for 11 years. And specifically, what you do is you interact with the community, but with young people specifically, don't you, to try and find the best solutions for them, keep them out of trouble, get them on the right tracks, help them out. So with this experience, this uh, terrible thing that's happened in this neighbourhood, what have you sought to do since then? Well, we were already doing stuff before then. Back in 2009, we, had, we saw more and more mainly young men taking risks. So we did a project called Risky Business, and Reese was involved in it. And we identified all the young people who took the highest risks. And then we did a whole load of work with them and, and women as well. And we did a we used outdoor education to look at taking risks and then talking to them about the risk. And some risks they didn't bother doing, like jumping 45 foot into a river. And I says, well, why don't you do that? And it was a, a contrast in the fact of incidents in their lives. They'd say, well, it just happened, Mike. But then they didn't realise about the consequence. But then when you did structured stuff... They thought about it and then they thought more about the risks. So we used outdoor education and we talked about why young people take risks. And that was the start of it. Let me ask you about the programme that you launched after Reese died. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was called Cuts Both Ways. I'd worked with two young men and had a relationship with them and one stabbed the other one in the neck. Luckily, the, the lad didn't die, but I got the two of them together and we worked with them about creating a, a street-based card game, as it were, that you could take out on the streets and you came up with scenarios of things that happened. So trying to diffuse things. Yeah, it makes people think about actions and consequences. So the cards would say, you know, you saw a bite, you took it from outside the, the shop, and then it turned out to be the local drug dealers, and then all the consequences that followed on from that, and all the different routes that that may lead to. Your, young, your friend's carrying a knife, and then there's different options of which cart, which route you took. That tend to strike a chord with a lot of them because it was designed by a perpetrator and a victim of knife crime. So they were actually, it was on the same level for the young people. So we've been doing probably preventative work around knife crime for about 10 years now. Michael Lockhart, you work for Streetwise. You work in Newcastle, it's seven miles away, and there are, there are different issues there aren't they in particular with the people that that you work with tell us about that yeah so the young men i work with tend to be hanging around the city center and the program we've done is around mental health and how beam young men are sort of isolated and then drawn to sort of what might be deemed as gang culture so we've come up with a project called level up and we sort of encourage them to level up their ideas and talk to us about how we can change stereotypes and how they can sort of work on themselves, really. It's very much driven by what their ideas are and how, how they feel, what's important to them. We're based here in a community which has, has had ongoing problems of social deprivation and so on. And we've also heard that knife crime isn't the feature. It's different from the way it, it is in large city centres. So, so what are you seeing there in terms of an increase in knife crime or in young people holding or carrying knives? I wouldn't like to say if there's been an increase. I think that it's probably more to do with the fact that it's a little bit more out there now. And there's a culture of gangs and glorification of like hip hop and that sort of thing, which attracts a certain type of person. Because if you're going to carry a knife, I don't think that educationally we can stop that person carrying a knife. Because if you're going to carry a knife, you're going to carry a knife. What we need to do is tell people about the consequences of carrying a knife. Everyone knows knives are bad. And I think that's why for us, it's about making sure that if you know someone's carrying a knife, why? If you think that it's a good idea to carry a knife, why do you think it's a good idea to carry a knife? I think there's a sense, especially in Newcastle, about hopelessness and not being able to, um, for young people to be able to get a job, better themselves. It seems to be the easy way to sort of maybe take the easy option. One of the aspects that we're discussing here is what we've called second responders, which is about how you deal with this problem in the long term, how you respond to this issue of of knife crime. Now, you've said about the role of parents, what they mm. can do. Tell me a little bit about that. I think parents need to get more involved with their kid. Like, you bring your kid up to teach them right and wrong, they'll 
do their own path, they'll go on their own way. But from being little, you've got to get on the case, you know, kind of thing. If you know they're out all night, I mean, like this area at the minute, they, for some reason they're putting all the bus stop windows out. The young you've people are smashing the, yeah, the, the like, bus windows. Yeah, they're like, I've passed about five different ones a day in the day and like they're putting if that was my kid out playing now when they came in I would just I mean I'm not saying that they, they're the ones that's doing it but you've got to be start seeing your kids them windows that's been put out on the bus shop I hope it's not you you know I hope you're not getting involved in anything like that you've got to start saying to them things like this because they're just going out for the night coming back in nobody knows what they're doing there's no like interaction with the parents with them anymore. Nobody's they're not checking them. Kids carry reputations. There's kids out there that all carry knives and the mum and dads must know this. They must know that there's people going around saying their kids are carrying knives. Why aren't they checking them? When you're putting your kids' clothes in the wash, you're checking through their pockets. Why aren't they finding these things? It's gotta come from parents as well. They've got to start checking with their kids and talking to them and saying like these bad things are happening. I hope you're not involved. Now we have a question from the audience. My name's Caroline Smith. I am designated safeguard lead at King's Priory School, which is a mile up the road in Tynemouth. I'm interested to know from any of you really what your thoughts are about educating young people. So Sylvia, you've said that parents should have a greater grip really on what their children are doing. It's not that you can blame the parents. Like I say, you, you bring them up to teach them right from wrong, they will do that own thing, but it's getting in there and trying and saying to them, you know, all this is going on in the area. Just talking to them, really, because they're getting desensitised to crime. They don't, they're watching all this thing on telly and then they don't see the other side of it. If I watch something with my little grandson and I think it's, I'll say, you do know he's just hit him and that would really hurt in real life, you know. It's getting them to understand that it is a thing that's going to hurt and it's it's going to harm somebody. Mm. And You're absolutely right and I think parents are obviously the first port of call for this kind of thing but I'm interested to know what sort of thing we can introduce into schools to help educate children on the consequences of carrying knives. Sylvia let me come to you because this is very specifically I know something that you're seeking to to do at the moment with Mike and then we'll come on to you Mike yeah. so tell so us. I'm working with the Phoenix at the minute and we're putting together a film basically about what happened to Reese and the consequences of how it's affected not just my family but the lives of the family of the person who done it, it right through to the emergency services that had to deal. It's a big, huge ricochet. Nobody walked away that night unaffected, right down to the, the police that attended, to the ambulance, to the doctor that had to come and tell me. We're trying to show them the consequences of it's not something that will ever go away and it's carried forward. And these kind of things, it can be carried further for generations. Let me come to you, Mike Burgess, we had a question there about education. You work with young people. Can you educate young people against all the pressures, peer pressure and other things that are going on not to carry a knife, not to react in a certain way? If you've got youth workers around, they can give a different argument. If you're not careful, the young person are usually learning from the peers and what they see on the television. And it's good to give a counter argument of why they need to think about the actions and consequences and the, what their actions will bring. So it's putting a counter-argument on a street corner or wherever with those young people. We also do work in the local PALS, which is like a lot of the young people not in, in mainstream school. Okay. And we run a session there on actions and consequences and we use a letter from a lad in prison for knife crime. And he talks about a whole load of things in that. And that's quite powerful then for the young people that we do the training with. So we are doing stuff with teenagers, but obviously... Sylvia talks about the film. We're working with the police, Falcons Rugby, a whole load of other agencies in putting a film together. And we've involved education in it. The idea is to have a film that's actually quite emotional at the beginning, but then you've got gaps in that film so that you can do work with groups of young people. Let me come on to Michael Lockhart here. You work for Streetwise and you work in Newcastle. What are the ages of the people that you work with, first of all? The young people I work with are 13 to 17 and they're young men. And just talking about education, I think there needs to be a change in education as a whole because I think when I talk to these young men, mainstream education something doesn't work for them and I think there needs to be a, a sort of change of how... They might be able to pass a test or they might not be able to pass a test, but that doesn't really have an impact on their life and they can't see the benefit. 
and it might be a more a different route and for everyone's different aren't they so whether you're into sports or music or if you're academic we have to find what works for the individual and I think that's what's failing some of our young people I think we need to change it so that every young person can find the thing that they excel in because if you excel at something, then you're going to want to do it more. Yes, an individual approach trying to address individual solutions for individuals. But, you know, you're dealing with quite a large number of people in a city centre. What can you do with the resources that you've got? Empower the young people. I think that's what's also missing. Because if you're sitting in a classroom of 30 other young people and the only bit of attention you get is when you misbehave or even if you're positive... Everyone wants the attention, don't they? That's what it, we all crave it from, whether it's a partner or we, we want to be taught we're doing something well. And I think that's what we as youth workers, project workers, we want to empower the young people to take pride in whatever it is they're doing. So by giving young people a sense of pride, hopefully it'll stop them then thinking, well, the only thing I'm good at is being the hardest person on my street or the baddest man or my, whatever it is that they're getting recognition for possibly in a negative way. Caroline, can I come back to you as given what you've heard, I mean, and, and given your role in working in education, does any of that resonate? It does, yes. I think that, Mike, you talked about the glorification of carrying knives before and that really kind of struck a chord for me because I think that a lot of young people that I work with wouldn't are aware of the consequences already of carrying knives. Um, I mean, the school that I work in doesn't have an issue really at all. But from what I know about young people and knives, it's the whole idea of just having one on them rather than using, correct me if I'm wrong. Empowering young people is something that we've done as educators, we try and do all of the time. So yes, what I'm saying is absolutely, I agree that they need something that gives them the attention positively so that they're not known for being the person that carries the knife or walks around and is, you know, the hard man or whatever. But it just doesn't seem to be quite, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to quite, doesn't feel right almost, like it needs something a bit more practical and quicker. We've got an interjection there. If you could just pass the mic over. Could you say your name, please? Hi, I'm Becky. I'm one of the youth workers at Finnish Touch Youth Project. And Becky, you are in the piece that we played earlier. Yeah, so I think it was just picking up on something Michael said about empowering young people. And I think, like you're saying, Caroline, maybe some of the students in your school, it's not an issue, but I think the idea of the film is that hopefully it can be shown in all the schools and it's just to make young people aware of what they could do if they see someone else carrying a knife out in the street. So it might not even be people in their immediate sphere of influence, but it's just about giving young people the confidence that they can maybe do something about it. It might be telling an adult at school, it might be reporting them through the fearless organisation. You know, there are things and I think that's what we just want to make the film about. It's not just aiming it at young people who are carrying knives. So I think it's just aiming it at all young people so that they're aware that there are options out there about what they can do. Thank you. Now, I just want to go to our next question. Uh, Mike Duthie from Crime Stoppers. Really interested to understand why North Tyneside hasn't seen a rise in knife crime. And from your experience, what does central government do? What three things should they be doing to make sure that knife crime's reducing elsewhere? Let's start with Michael Lockhart. I suppose it always comes down to money. I know that no one wants to hear that, but it's the cut, isn't it? I think as in the North East, we feel it more than most sometimes. I think we've forgotten about it a little bit, especially from central government. There is a sense that up here we are the, the one that no one likes to talk about. But let me ask you, okay, so it does come down to resources a lot. The subtext of that is if what will your priorities be in spending money? What's the very first thing that you would want to do if you had a bit more money? It's a bit of a tough question. If we've got this endless amount of money, we'd do everything, wouldn't we? For me, it's just more engagement, being able to reach more people. That's how we would spend the money, being able to employ more people to get into the schools, to educate people and employ the right people. Unfortunately, we need more young people to talk about their experiences. I'm 32. When I work with some of the, the young men I work with, I'm an old, old man to them. <laughs> and that may come as a surprise, but I am to them. And we need to get more young people into youth work. And that's how we'll help and reach more people. Mike Burgess, obviously resources are always important. But I suppose the question is, yes, you get more from central government, but can you really affect attitudes? There's a lot of things, social media and music and elsewhere, which is also affects the way that young people behave and act and, and react. So... Is it resources and, or is it something else that, that you would need or want? It's all right. What happens, central government do is they throw chunks of money at things 
And then when it calms down, then they reduce it. And I think the worst thing they've done is actually, I knew really good youth workers who had been in inner city London, in those estates, working with the gangs, and they'd been there five, ten years. If you take all that funding away and then you sack them, it takes an awful long time to get that trust built. You need people to build trust within the communities. You need key people to build trust within those communities and develop relationships with the right those young people or whoever it is. That takes time and money over a long period of time. My example would be I'd worked with two lads for three years and I knew them well. There's no way I could have done that piece of work where I got the perpetrator and the victim, one in prison, one out of prison, to work on a project to actually deal with that. The greatest thing was when it came to the lad coming out, he said, what's the other lad going to do? And the other lad was saying, what's he going to do? I act as a mediator to say, well, I think there's no mileage in you doing anything or you doing anything because you've both worked on a really good project that's worked. And they came out and they bumped into each other two weeks later and they shook hands and walked on. So I do think investing in people on the ground to do that work long term does make a difference within these difficult communities but it, it's not one of those short things the other thing for me is you've got a perfect storm in the fact if you've got rid of youth workers and then you've also got rid of half the police force there was 18 youth workers in this borough and because of the cuts, they lost all the, the youth service. So this is about the. We, we were talking about the second responders. So the yeah. the ability to respond, as, yeah. as you're saying, has been severely reduced. Yeah. Yes, you haven't got. You've stripped all the people working on the ground in the communities. You've then halved the the police force. I know for a fact, if you get enough young people gathered in an area, they haven't got the resources to respond to it. Then you've got a cut back in social services, so dealing with all the vulnerable people that need that extra support. And then you've got cutbacks in mental health services. So I think there is a perfect storm. Sylvia, when we spoke earlier, you described yourself as kind of, in a way, feeling there was an inevitably worsening situation. Where do you see hope? We're trying to get into the schools. That's what I was saying. We're trying to get in there while they're young and educating. There's, like I say, there's some of them that's too far gone in they're not going to change. But the young ones now, we've got to get into the, the younger ones now. Tell me about the, the award in Reese's name that's given every year. When we lost Reese, a lot of people like were heartbroken and wanted it to keep his memory going. So they set up the award and we choose a, a young person that's doing really well for the community and doing well for themselves. And they, they have it, they're shown that there is a way out and that there is things that are achievable. Just because you're from a council estate doesn't mean to say you can't achieve anything. Some of them aren't academic, but there is other skills that they can use. It's just getting it out and showing them that they can do that. And I don't. think that, that is the hope for me. I've never come across a young person that isn't optimistic about their future. They're always wanting to do something. They're always, they've always got dreams. It's just sometimes those dreams get beaten out of them a little bit by their situation. The thing that gives me hope is that every time we work with young people, they'll always want to do something. I've never come across a young person who wants to carry a knife. They might be scared. They might be vulnerable. They might feel like they have to. But that's the thing. We've got to, we can't give them the... They're scared, so they're carrying knives. They can't use that as the excuse. They've got to see the consequences. of If you're carrying it, you're going to end up using it or have it used against you. That's got to be pointed out to them. You are going to suffer the consequences for carrying that knife. It, there's no excuse under the sun why you've got it. Let me go to our next question. OK, I'm Jonathan Hamill, and uh, I represent Crime Stoppers in Durham and Darlington. I'm interested to hear from people tonight about what the perception is, what the feeling is within the communities about knife crime. How serious an issue do they think it is? And what's your feelings from engaging with communities about the level of knife crime and the seriousness of it? OK, so we have potentially two quite different views of that, both from here in this community in North Tyneside and also from Newcastle. Let's start in Newcastle uh, with you, Michael Lockhart. The young people I work with, whenever we ask them about knife crime, they always say that that isn't a problem. That's, that's something that they often tell us. I think the reality is a little bit different, though, because I think there is people who, who aren't just carrying knives. We've got to talk about people carrying screwdrivers and anything that they think are protecting themselves. So I think it's a really difficult question, actually, to see how young people are naive, if we're being really honest. So whenever we ask that question, they always will say, oh, there's not an issue because 
there isn't an issue to them there and then. But I've also worked with some young people who said, yes, I think about carry a knife because I hear about it quite a lot. Mike Burgess. Within the community, I don't think we come across lots of very, very rarely, it's more isolated incidents to do with young people who operate in high-risk areas. What we're hearing from you both is thankfully a, a lot better picture than, than we have heard elsewhere in the country. Sylvia, amongst the people who knew Reese, his friends and, and his peer group, what did they say about knives? Is there a sense that his death sent a very strong message about, about the danger of knives? Well, they were pretty much all in, enraged about it. A lot of his friends are... They do get into their fights and stuff, but they, they'll fight with their, their fists kind of thing. And they were, you know, they all went berserk. I think they went to the papers to do a campaign to drop the knives and stuff after he's died. And hopefully they getting into the young ones and saying if they are catching them on the estate with knives and telling them, you know, that's wrong, drop it kind of thing. But So hopefully out of that tragedy, a message gets across to people that yeah. potential consequences... I'd like to thank our three panellists here this evening. Michael Lockhart from Streetwise, Mike Burgess, the project manager at the Phoenix Detached Youth Project, and also Sylvia Welsh for their contributions. In certain respects, it's been uplifting to hear that the problems in this area aren't the same as the problems elsewhere, but obviously it's been very powerful to hear Sylvia's testimony. There are further programmes in this series, a Community Conversations, where we will be hearing from other parts of the country about other issues faced there. This podcast has been made for Crime Stoppers by Earshot Strategies. I'm Richard Myron, and the producer is Anouk Mie. Crime Stoppers is an independent charity that gives people the power to speak up to stop crime 100% anonymously. If you have information on a crime, you can contact Crime Stoppers by phone and online 24-7, 365 days a year. Just call 0800 555 111 or visit crimestoppers-uk.org. <laughs>